bubble. What? <laughs> How to buy and sell a used car in this market. Brian, I'm super excited about uh, this show that we're going to talk about because I think this will be helpful. I think a lot of folks who are out there that are seeing some unique things going on are like, man, what do I do? Give me some tips. Give me some tricks. Help me out. And I'm hoping we're going to be able to kind of speak into that void today. What a weird time to be alive right now. Coming yep. out of this um, pandemic, we're seeing all kind of distortions with home prices, with now vehicles. Yep. I mean, supply chain issues. I went to um, Chick-fil-A Saturday morning. Um, their mobile app wasn't letting me order, so I was like, "What's?" because that's the way I hack that's and, the way and you sit out it. in the yep. parking lot, and then they come bring the food to you. It wouldn't let me do it. And come to find out, they're out of breakfast items. I don't know how in the world. I like don't know supply if, chain. I don't was know the if issue? that's eggs. So they're serving lunch at eight thirty in the morning. I don't know how that oh. works, but it's just a weird time to be alive. And it, it has even made it to one of the worst assets you can have in your financial life, which is vehicles. Because mm -hmm. we always tell you guys, there's a reason we have twenty three eight. Remember, you own vehicles. You always want to put down 20%. You want to finance them no longer than three years. You want to make sure that the car payments aren't more than 8% of your gross income. And of course, if they're luxury vehicles, same as cash, you got to pay them off quickly. And we want your investments, your monthly investments, to be bigger than your monthly car payment because these things are horrible financially. But in 2021... They make money. So, Bo, tell us what's going on. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. Uh, right now, there is a supply shortage on vehicles, right? You can't get new cars. But what's really interesting is it's not because there are not new cars out there. Essentially, what happened is when everything shut down during the pandemic last year, chip manufacturers decided that, you know what? Automobiles probably aren't going to be changing hands. We're anticipating a slowdown. So rather than focusing on automobile chips that are needed to be able to run the computers and those systems, we're going to focus on more consumer electronics, more of those sorts of things. And so what's really interesting in the way that our current global supply chain works is that that one small shift has huge long-tailed ramifications. Well, then the COVID bubble kind of turned around really quickly and people started getting out and people started wanting to replace their cars. And now their most auto manufacturer waiting on those chips to be able to actually get their fleet out into the hands of consumers. So you just said something that there's a lot of cars that have been made, but they're not actually able to be sold because there's no chips that's in right. them to make them work. So they're just piling up. And that's resulting when you drive by dealerships, you see that there's like three cars, new cars yep. for sale. So that's obviously pushed, um, had some distortions and trickle, trickle down effect on used cars. And so the question is, how much have used cars gone up. Yeah, what I think is interesting is you may not know this, but when it comes to used car prices, how they sort of change year over year, it's relatively stable. Mm -hmm. uh, Daniel went and pulled some data for us, and this is just dating back to 2015, kind of showing you, you know, do the price of used cars increase or decrease? And this is from the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. And you can see, you know, it's a relatively tight spread. You know, the, the price of used cars may be up a percent or down a percent year over year. But as we got, have gotten into 2020, now into 2021, you can see it has been a hockey stick. It has absolutely gone exponential in how much used car prices have increased. And that's why you can see we're up to a 30% year over year increase. And this is when, and that's why we put it in the title, the, the, the thought of bubble starts kicking Absolutely. in because if you see something historically that's flat and now all of a sudden it's 30 percent more expensive you have to ask yourself what exactly is getting what's causing this and and Bo, here's the first thing you alluded to this and i think we have a visual to kind of show this there's not chips there manufacturing is occurring of vehicles like the f-150 yep. But they don't have chips to actually sell them, so they're just stockpiling at, at motor speedways all across the country. And we even have a picture that shows this of the F-150s. Guys, there, look, there, there's as, no as shortage far, of vehicles. As, the, as far as the eye can see, they have trucks that have been made but are unable to be sold. Well, you said something in pre-show planning. You're like, if I think if I'm in the market for a truck... I might be waiting. Yeah, I mean, because what it seems like they're going to have, you know, and again, this is us sort of reading the tea leaves. It seems like there's going to be a huge glut that will eventually be released onto the market once the chip manufacturers can kind of catch up and the, the supply can meet the demand. Well, when that happens, I got to believe that all these manufacturers are going to want to 
unload this inventory. Now, what we don't know is how much pent up demand there are. I'll use F-150 as an example. How many folks out there want to go buy a new truck? But man, just seeing how many there are makes me think, man, if, if I'm someone who's looking to buy a truck, I might want to wait until this thing corrects They're a little bit. They're going to want to get these trucks like on the market at some point, and that's going to have a swing back effect, yep. I believe, in some ways. But it's not only supply chain. Guys, I want to tell you, we have we are experiencing inflation mm-hmm. right now. It just The supply chain is impacting how easy it is to get all the parts and components to go into building a price. And then also you're seeing the acquisition cost of just general materials, yep. petroleum as well as just the supplies. And that's having a direct effect on used car markets as well. And this is, I talk to you guys, I say the best inflation hedge you can have is to own stuff. Now, normally when I give you that statement, I'm talking about real estate is a great inflation hedge. I'm talking about businesses and stocks are a great inflation hedge because companies can always just raise their prices to their end consumer. Little did I know that the oddest illustration of this fact is going to be vehicles. Because I've told you, vehicles are typically napalm for your personal finances because they depreciate. You have to pay to keep them up. You have to pay for insurance. There's a lot of negatives to to vehicles. But right now, they're actually appreciating. And we wanted to kind of show you what in the world is going on and how do you even move to make a good decision in this weird situation. Yeah, I think it's interesting, Brian. You know, vehicles, we talk about this all the time. They, they tend to be very emotional decisions, right? When someone, you know, one of the best things you can do in your car buying is you try to remove as much emotion out of it. You try not to go to the dealership, don't buy same day, that sort of thing. Well, when you take a very emotional decision and you have this overlay of scarcity on top of it, it tends to make people make very, very poor decisions where they were already, already, uh, highly likely to make a poor decision because it is such an emotional thing. Well, we've seen this. Like in the in the housing marketplace, we heard all due diligence has pretty much gone out the yep. window, meaning that in, in housing, it's cash offers. There's, you know, essentially as is. You're not even waiving inspections waiving and doing appraisals. those type of waiving appraisals. Well, unfortunately, this is also happening into the vehicle marketplaces where people are just paying, you know, sticker on new cars, if not even more than stickers. They're, they're stop the negotiation process, and they're not even doing due diligence. I even I've had a neighbors, you know, who've shared that they they basically drove by a dealership, saw that there was a car delivery, you know, dropping off brand new cars, and they pulled into the dealership and just said, "I'll take one of those if that's there's insane. one available," because there's just not inventory of new cars, and that's led to more people buying used. So just don't forget that you're a financial mutant. I do not want, because we have these weird distortions in the marketplace where you get into the mania Mm -hmm. of thinking, hey, I've got to buy a car right now, and you lose all of your financial mutant skills of due diligence, research, and making sure that you are getting the value of the vehicle you're buying. So I think one of the things that would be valuable is if we maybe talked about, okay, well, how should I approach making a purchase decision right now? How should I participate in this market? And I thought the first point you put in here, Brian, was beautiful. It was hurry up and stand still. Sort of reevaluate, do I need to be making this automotive decision right now? Do I have a car that I need to replace? Do I need to be upgrading? Do I need to be changing? Or is this something where maybe the best action for me to do in this current market is to do nothing? Well, it remains to be seen if this is going to be a long-term effect because realize price is impacted by supply and demand. Basic economics, we know there's a big demand right now. We know that there's limited supply because the 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 chip issue, but we also have seen that there's fields of these new cars Mm -hmm. that will be floating out into the marketplace. So knowing that this is a distortion that is caused by the supply chain issues as well as some of the inflation pressures, Makes me wonder: Should you just wait? Sure. Let this wa- let this distortion just wash through the system. You'll probably be better. And here's indicators that you should actually do absolutely nothing. First, you're driving a reliable car currently that fits your life needs. If it's relatively low mileage and it does what you need to do for your family and it gets you from A to B and it's not always in the shop and it doesn't have a huge cost of upkeep. Might not be a horrible thing to hold on to, at least for the time being. And then if your car's paid for, guys, there is nothing better than how a paid-for car drives. I mean, just while you're driving with that paid-off car, you can look around and go, that neighbor's in debt, that neighbor's in debt. (laughs) I'm paid for. And it just drives so much better. So 
just hurry up, stand still, let the situation wash over you if you're not in need of a new vehicle or a used vehicle at this point. Now, there is a little bit of price distortion going on, though. If you do own a certain type of vehicle, we've already talked about, if we are in this bubble, bubble means that the price of certain things has increased. Well, if you have to happen to find yourself on the side of the equation where you drive an automobile that is in high demand, which means the price of it's really increased, and maybe you no longer need that type of automobile or that type of conveyance, you're thinking to yourself, well, should I sell this and maybe ship to something else? This may be an ideal market for you. I'm looking out there at you messy middle participants because, and this is, once again, post-pandemic, weird stuff going on is the biggest demand for used vehicles right now is in pickup trucks, mm -hmm. sports cars, and even some of the luxury brands. Yep. Like one of the biggest appreciators over the last year is like the Mercedes G Wagon. Yep. I can think of some nothing less practical than a Mercedes G Wagon, yet this is what's going on. So, guys, if you're one of these people, like I said, if you have a sports car, you're young in your 20s, early 30s, this car, it was great. You know, you lived a time, had the time of your life. Now that you're starting to have some kiddos, and you've decided maybe the minivan, this Might is the perfect sense. marketplace for you because there are some crazy distortions going on where certain body types, certain types of vehicles are actually appreciating rapidly. Meanwhile, there's other sectors that are kind of mm -hmm. not doing much. You want to play that arbitrage situation to your benefit. Yeah, to give you some sort of hard and fast numbers, when we look at used car price changes year over year, Pickup trucks are up about 25% year over year. Coupes are up about 22% and convertibles are up about 25%. So like you said, if you're someone who owns that type of vehicle already, but maybe it does not quite fit your needs, this may not be a horrible time to sell, may not be a horrible time to capitalize on that bubble. But then the immediate question you have is, okay, well, what, what do I buy? What should I change to? Well, if you look at the used cars that have had the lowest increase in price year over year, uh, hatchbacks are up about 12%, minivans are up about 15%, and SUVs are up about 14%. I think you described it perfectly. If you are that person that is in that late 20s, messy middle, early to mid 30s, this might be prime time for you to think about making that shift. Well, what's interesting, because this vehicle type has an impact, but also where you live. All the places that have huge population increases. I'm talking about Atlanta. Yep. I'm talking about Jacksonville, Florida. A lot of these big cities that have big, lots of new residents moving in, they also are having tremendous distortions in their prices. So when I see this, it's not only vehicle type, but it's also location and geography. Guys, there's a way to play that. And, and Bo has a perfect experience here. Just because your area is rapidly appreciating because there's a lot of people moving in, limited inventory, doesn't mean you buy your vehicle in that captive marketplace. Share what you did, Bo. Yeah, so my, uh, we had an ice storm here a couple months back, and my wife was in an incident where we had to replace her automobile. Uh, but we live right here in South Nashville, and it's just been booming. There's tons of folks moving here. The housing market's taking off, and you know the auto market thus is taking off with it. And so when we were looking for a vehicle that was going to make sense for the size of our family and stuff, uh, we narrowed it down to a few contenders, and we finally made our decision. We were amazed to find that if we were willing to buy from a more, more rural location, we actually bought from uh, a dealership that was about four hours away, if you can believe it, we were able to save, I want to say it was like five or $6,000 off the price of the vehicle simply because we did not buy it from the dealership here in town. And this was the real kicker. So I was coordinating with this dealership and I said, man, you know, I, I got little kids and we got to drive four hours and we got to drive four hours back. That's just going to take a whole weekend. You know, uh, what should I do? They're like, well, hey, would you like for us to deliver it to you? And I was like, oh man, okay, yeah, but oh, what's the price of that going to be? For a hundred bucks, they had a guy <laughs> drive my brand new car from uh, four hours away to my house, drop it off my driveway, and it was wonderful. So not only was there a convenience factor there, I was able to do that sort of rural to uh, highly populated city arbitrage, and it worked out really, really well for us. So I want to kind of I want to close the loop here and talk about this situation is perfect for financial mutants. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a website, uh, the, and I don't, I'm not super familiar with the website except for I came across, I kept coming across the same website when I was doing research. iccars.com has a lot of research on this type of stuff where you can see 
what surged in pricing, what is actually stabilized in pricing. This marketplace, guys, is perfect for my financial mutants yep. because there's lots of data out there. You just now need to go be a nerd and research the data to see where the opportunity lies. And look, and if there's not something that helps you, hurry up and stand still. But there's going to be a number of you that maybe you're driving around that clunker, mm -hmm. you know, that was worth $1,000 to $1,500. And every time you fuel it up or you put new tires on it, you have appreciated it by 25%. This is probably the time you ought to, you're going to get more money now as long as you want to buy into a vehicle type or an area of the country where you're not seeing those things like the minivans, the yep. hatchbacks, those type of things. You, you know, we were even looking brand specific. I remember when, when I was looking at this, one of the fastest depreciating cars out there is the Hyundai Sonata. Yep, that's right. But yet, it's a pretty reliable a vehicle, so there that's a distortion in the marketplace that allows you to go sell your car or trade it in at a higher price, go buy something that's actually stable or undervalued to it. That's what I want you to do. Go play the arbitrage situation to maximize this situation um, because this will probably regulate it or fix itself. And, and so there might be a, a short-term opportunity here. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, one of the things we love to do when we do this show is we love to answer your questions. Ultimately, the reason that we do the show is so that we can pour into your lives and provide value to your financial life. So if you have a question, make sure you're getting it in the live chat right now. We have our team out on the periphery getting those questions in front of us. And so we're going to try to load you up. And so here's a really good one. This one is from Ryan to kind of start us off. And it's in, in the realm of car buying. Uh, and Ryan says, I know you guys preach 23.8, but what about financing for a longer period and paying extra each month to provide more flexibility for investing for the future? Love the show. He's saying, so, okay, I like this. And, and I run into this all the time mm -hmm. with uh, friends, you know, young friends who are making their first car purchases or maybe they're upgrading that family automobile. Like, hey, I hear you, Bo. You talk about 23.8 all the time, but man, that three-year payment makes me a little nervous. And the dealership told me, hey, I can finance it over five years or over six years, but I can still pay extra to still pay it off in three. What are some considerations I ought to make as I think through that? The majority of car loans out there don't have prepayment penalties. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. So look, I have no problem when you go to get that vehicle and they offer you some teaser rate where it's 48 months, 60 months, you know, 1.9%, yep. and there's no difference. You get no benefit to, to, pay, to doing the 36-month loan. You can take the 48 or 60 month because that's your legal commitment, and it does give you flexibility. So maybe if you're squeezed, maybe sure, some life tight, event yeah. or you get tight, you do have flexibility. But that is what your legal requirement is to keep your credit up. But that's not actually what your internal commitment to yourself to keep your financial mutant status is because – I still want you to have that car paid off within three years. Yep. Because here's why we say three years. First of all, cars outside of 2021 depreciate like Absolutely. rocks. Yep. I mean, historically, cars are not keepers of value. Um, so that's always something that's, that you, you can just see the value falling off. And the last thing you want to do is get in a car accident and you owe more than the vehicle's worth. Now, I know there's going to be folks out there say, gap insurance. But sure. get, what are you doing when you buy a gap insurance? You're actually paying for something mm -hmm. that I, I would rather have my money working right. for me than, than to pay for an additional insurance policy because I don't really own my life. So that's, that's a big part of it is the depreciation. But the other part is, is guys, I want to keep your eyes from getting bigger than your wallet because it's easy with dealerships because the, now the average length of a car loan for a new vehicle is 72 months. I can't even get my I mean, head think about it. Most Six people don't years, drive cars for that long. Well, and I think that's partially what's driving some of these, these prices of luxury cars, sports cars. Why are these impractical vehicles mm -hmm. the ones that are rapidly appreciating in this distortion of a marketplace we're in right now? It's because... There's a lot of fakers. Yep. There's a lot of people yep. that want to look rich rather than be rich. Yep. And that's what, so I'd rather give you some constraints to keep yourself honest with yourself so that you don't look at, you know, a luxury vehicle and go, you know what? The payment on that Honda Accord is this, but you know, for $50 a month more, if I stretch out my payments five years, for five yeah. years or six years, um, Hey, it's only fifty dollars more. You're not paying attention that you added, th you know, three to four years to your financing. 
you don't really own your life. So that's why I want you to constrict that. And then don't ever, ever, ever forget your investment, monthly investments have to exceed your car payment because how can you ever build financial independence if all your money is going towards lifestyle purchases mm-hmm. like vehicles instead of building your army of dollar bills in the background? Yeah, I think that's great. I, I love that you're asking the question of flexibility. And it is okay, but just recognize that with additional flexibility comes additional responsibility. And if you find you're one of those people that if, the, if you know the minimum payment is X and all you're ever going to pay is X, then maybe do that three years so you force yourself to have to pay it off in three. That was a great question. Um, this next question is from uh, Bernardo. And he said, hey, Brian and Bo, uh, since I can open a 529 account in different states, what should I consider before I pick one? So for those of you that don't know, uh, 529s are educational savings vehicles, and all 50 states now offer them where you can open up a college savings account for your child or grandchild uh, directly with the state. So with 50 options plus a ton of different advisor sold options. How do I know which one to decide and what are some things I should look for? Well, the biggest, let me go ahead and get, go, take this in priority of where the lowest lying fruit is. See if there's a tax deduction That's in your it. state. Yep. I, I got to tell you, a lot of states, you'd be surprised, are going to give you a deduction. So if you're if you're living in a state that's a 5% or 6% state income tax and they give you a deduction for that, that is that's great. That's free money, guys. Yep. So take advantage of that. So that's the first thing to pay attention to. The second thing is is what's the quality of the plan? Mm-hmm. I mean, for years and years and years, like Utah has yep. one of the best rated plans because it's it's got a, a Vanguard mm-hmm. 529 plan with super low costs good investments, you know, and ease of use with a lot of their features, that's done so well because of all those benefits Mm -hmm. that people who live in states that don't have an income tax benefit, they've considered that an opportunity. But there's now a third provision that I want you to pay attention to, the clawback provision. That's right, yep. Because we have found out, and Daniel has helped bring this to our attention in a lot of the research, is that some of the states, especially the ones that give you tax deductions, like the state of Georgia, for one, I know, if you take those assets from that Georgia 529 and try to move them to, say, Tennessee's 529, if you took a tax benefit, they're going to say, hey, you can take that money, but we're going to make you claw back those tax benefits you paid to us at the state of Georgia. So be aware of that. Your money is not as fluid as you think. So that's why make sure you research, are there tax deductions? How is the operations of this 529? And then third is, is this free to use or is this a a state that has a clawback? Those all need to come into play in your decision making. You know, a few resources you can use. We've done, uh, usually uh, once a year or so, we'll do a show on sort of the top rated college savings or top rated 529 plans. And you'll find that every year, you mentioned Utah, perennially, perennially there are some that are at the top of the list. So I would encourage you, go look at those lists of plans that tend to be good every year or go look at any one of our shows. You can go to moneyguy.com, just type in college saving or type in 529 in the search bar. And we've done a lot of shows that will help walk you through how to think about that. Um, Great question. Um, Let me ask you a question really quick. You've bought a car private party before, right? You've done that. You've had that transaction. This question is from Ryan. Uh, And he says, can you guys cover the actual process of the selling transaction, right? So if I'm going to sell an automobile, Uh, Like, do I need to just accept a huge stack of cash to be safest, or do we go to the bank to get an ACH transfer? It seems like there are a lot of scams out there. Yeah. What are some things I can think about to keep myself protected through the transaction? It's it's so interesting. Just last week on Twitter, somebody that I I consider a conference friend, somebody Mm -hmm. I hang out with at conferences when when those were existing, (laughs) and I think they're coming back, um, he said he just put a car up and, um, and got, like, 12 offers, but half of them, you know, were all people trying to scam me. It was all bogus scams. So I think you really need to be careful. This has always been a a very concerning issue. And that's why you hear about best practices like, hey, go meet them at their bank, bank. you know, for the the, the test drive and other things. So it it is an interesting time to to sell cars private party. First of all, let's talk about this. In Georgia, it used to be great to do private party or to buy a private party because you didn't have to pay the um, tag fee sure. on on the purchase price. But then a few years ago, the state of Georgia changed it to where it doesn't matter if you're buying used cars, new mm-hmm. cars. When you go to tag them, 
they're going to charge you, I think it's around 7.5% mm-hmm. or somewhere around the 7% range to get the tag for that vehicle. So it kind of took away all the benefits to buy a private party because you no longer were able to avoid that, that tag tax, essentially. So with, with that being the case, if you live in a state where there's zero benefit to buying or selling private party, that's why people typically will trade in at a dealership because you get a sales tax offset on what you trade in. It's the whole like kind exchange. Yep. You're trading in a vehicle. Now, when you're actually selling, so that's the first thing. So if you're a person, you might want to just trade it in so you don't have to do the hassle because I always get nervous. Um, I sold Bo a car once. <laughs> <laughs> and um, that car, it was the greatest car in the world for me, but probably two months afterwards, Bo started having and, technical yep. problems with it, spent a fortune repairing it. And I think you still haven't completely forgiven me because you think that I... I don't know how you okie dug me, sabotaged you, you. Somehow you okie dug me. I don't know how. That, I, and that's, so that's what my first word of caution on being a private seller is be careful selling to friends and family, sure. even if it was the greatest car in the world for you because... That one little oil leak that drips a, a few drips might turn into a complete engine rebuild without you knowing it, yep. a.k.a. what happened to yep. Bo. It's, um, so, so be careful of that. And the other thing is, is that, that you are running the risk when you do a private seller of the scammers. So here's what the best practices. First of all, you don't sign the title until after you got mm-hmm. money in your bank. And yep. you have to be very careful. And I think that's why in this new digital world it's even scarier because I have, when I've sold private party cars, the way I've done it is I've met them at their actual mm-hmm. bank. Meaning I say, who do you bank with? Show me your checkbook um, so I know this is your actual bank. Yep. And then I, you, when you go into the bank, you actually have the bank transfer, the you know do the withdrawal, meaning it's not a check. Mm-hmm. It's nothing like that. It's actually recorded on the bank's books that you they've taken this money and it's free and clear and there's not anywhere. Mm-hmm. They got money coming and yep. they're hoping to play off the float. You actually get the money and then after you have the money, you can then sign the the, the, the title, title away. Yep. But that, I, I got to tell you though, in this new modern world, it's getting much, much easier through Carvana. Mm-hmm. I mean, old school CarMax, you can go. There's yep. places that will buy your car without you taking that risk. Um, so it's something if you, plus you don't want to deal with the, I know my wife, when we were selling her, she had this little Honda Del Sol, a little sporty car. You're nervous about who's showing. You don't want to give them your yeah, home address. Right. I, I right. would tell you, meet them in, a, in a, at least a safe place because you just don't know these days. And, and it, I hate to be that way about the uh-huh. public, but you just have to be very careful when you're doing these type of transactions. And would you recommend, generally, if you are going to sell a private party, uh, writing up some sort of bill of sale, some sort hmm. of like as is? Great point. This yeah. is a thing. Definitely you, definitely write up a, a, a bill of sale, and you've got to make sure you check that as is provision on there. And one more complication on why I think the majority of people, especially in a state that doesn't give you a benefit from it, just, you know, trade it in and just be a really good, um, you know, negotiator. Because that's what the other thing. Here's a Bo learned this, too. Um, But he got me back on that car, by the way, because when you go to trade it in, a lot of times, especially if you're buying a new car, they're restricted on how much further they can come down on the new car price. So all the give is either in the financing Mm -hmm. or in the used car price. So I felt so bad about Bo having to rebuild that car that I told him I would buy it back from him. And um, he got me because the dealer kept squeezing the price up, <laughs> thousand, thousand, thousand. And I was like, okay, I guess I'm still buying it. Yep, it all worked out really, really well in the wash. That was a great question. All right, uh, here is the next one. This is from no, uh, Nocilla or Nocia. Um, how do you recommend saving for midterm maybes, a.k.a. big-ticket goals that don't have a firm timeline yet? And for the example they used was like a, ca- a car or a house or a we- wedding. So it sounds like you know they've been working through their order of operations. They know they need their emergency fund, but there are other things they think they might want to save for, like an automobile or like a house or like a car. Does that just go into a savings account, or are there are other ways you can think about accumulating those dollars? Well, and, and look, I love this. When you're talking in terms of the financial order of operations, you know, step one is deductibles covered. That's just to keep your life out of the financial ditch for the emergencies that pop up. I like with emergency reserves, step four of the financial order of operations, since it is a range of typically for a working person, it's three to six months. For a person that is, um, you know, in retirement, it can go 18 to 36 months who's actually retired. So, but when it, you have a range of somebody who has three to six months, it, you will find 
that that allows you to have a lot of flexibility on these one-off things like car purchases and, and you know and, and things that are as you put it midterm maybe goals hopefully get built into that and, and here's the other part I want to give some freedom I think if you're saving 20 to 25 percent of your income sometimes your cash is going to run a little rich yep. because of these buckets that you've set up for cars for a big vacation that's going to take two or three years to save for, um, or even just opportunity capital so that when there's distortions in the marketplace, you're available. But you you didn't hear me say that we're going to do this in lieu of saving. I still think that you got to make sure that's why we created the financial order of operations. So, you know, go get the free money from your employer, pay off the high interest debt. Where does the Roth and HSA and all the maxing out the retirement you got to know where those things fall into it so you know how to do these one-off things because I'm hoping that three to six months reserves is going to also give you the froth to help you buy the cars and other things as well. Now, one thing that I struggle with uh, is that, you know, money you're saving cash right now is not paying a ton, right? Yeah. You're, you're, there, there's a likelihood you're leaving money on the table. Well, if these things you're saving for could potentially be farther out than like four, five, six years, you start beginning to really think about the opportunity cost loss for that money sitting there. So I think if you do have an unknown goal that you think might be 48 to 60 months in the future or greater, I don't think there's anything crazy about dollar cost averaging that savings into some sort of well-diversified or conservative balanced allocation inside of an after-tax account. So it's not just saving up all cash. I think you still should save up cash and certainly save up cash for things that are going to happen in the next 36 to 48 months. But after that period, I don't think there's anything wrong with just dollar cost averaging into a nice conservative balanced fund to do so. I do want to give some guidance that I think will, will also help with this question. Mm -hmm. Realize what step four, emergency reserves, we talk about three to six months of income. Mm -hmm. You don't live off your income. Nope. You live off of your monthly expenses. So guys, that three to six months already has a little froth because it's got your, your savings in it. It's got you know taxes and other things that are going away. If you want to know where the bare bones of where you, the bone is, where you don't cut into your life too much and get caught naked... Yep. Go figure out what three to six months of your living expenses are, because that's kind of what you need to keep yourself safe with. And then what the difference between living expenses versus the three to six months of income, that's a little bit of a margin that you could use for some of these midterm for goals sure. as well. But it also will keep you honest with yourself so you know where to not go, where no-go land is. And that's why you need to know what your monthly expenses are so you can kind of make sure you know where those guardrails are. That's great. Um, all right, this next question is from Earl. Uh, Earl says, I'm 38. I already have a lot saved for retirement. That's great. A simulator said I am saving too much, 33% mm -hmm. of my income. Uh, is it possible to save too much for retirement? Yeah, there's a fine line between financial mutant and miser. Um, I, I've shared with you guys a lot of life experiences and the fact that I'm okay, Earl, if, you, if you're saving 33%, but you're also living your best life ever. Mm -hmm. If you are a person, though, you're finding that you're eating ramen every night, um, you're not going on vacation, um, you, when your friends go out, they know that you're not you know, offering to pick up the tab for drinks or anything like that ever you might be squeezing it a little too tight. So that's why we do give you the, when we're talking about financial order of operations, we give you the parameters of what you need to be saving kind of by age mm -hmm. as well. But 20, 25% for most people who start saving in their 20s and 30s is a good indicator. If you can take your gross income and use one of those percentages, it is supposed to be a freeing indicator, meaning that once you are saving that 25%, you cannot feel guilty. You cannot feel stressed out because it's okay to go enjoy life a little bit more um, once you cross those thresholds. So if you feel like you're being super tight, that's probably a pretty good indicator that there might be something you need to be taking care of with that money as well. Now, let me play the other side of that coin a little uh -oh. bit. Are you going to tell him to keep saving now, at 33%? Here's what I'm going to say. I know I have a lot of friends out there. They just, it's hard for them to spend money. They like saving and they get excited from saving. You know, if they find a hundred dollar bill on the sidewalk, they get much more excited thinking about going to put that in their Roth and going and, you know, blowing it at the gas station, right? There are a lot of people fall in that category. 
Uh, so long as you're not living a modular life and you're not sacrificing a ton, I think it's okay if you have one of these crazy high savings rates and you're still able to do all the things you want to do the way you want to do because what that's going to do, especially for someone who's young in their early 30s, is it's going to provide you opportunities sooner in life to be able to do other things, right? So uh, can you over save for retirement? Yeah, probably if you're thinking about an average like 65-year-old age retirement. But if you save really aggressively early on, that's not to say that you might not have the option to leave the workforce at 60 or at 55 or at 50 if you've saved accordingly. I'm not suggesting you should sacrifice living in the here and now, but don't just go spend money for the sake of spending money. I, I will give some, some validity to your YOLO strategy or an <laughs> anti-YOLO strategy and the fact that... Un-YOLO. Well, people... People act like, why would I save all that money when I'm going to die before I eat at 65? Mm-hmm. I'm like, look, if you save enough from 20 to 40 mm-hmm. or 20 to 45, does a lot of the work. You'd for be you. surprised. I mean, because I'm I'm unfortunately old enough now that I'm reaching those levels. And um, what's great, because I was tight early, I'm I feel like I am living the YOLO life. Mm-hmm. As a financial mutant, yep. meaning that I can go on vacations that cost more than I made in my first year mm-hmm. out of college because I made because so much sacrifice earlier. Yep. But I do, I, I still want to go back. Don't be a miser. I want you to be charitable. I want you to make sure you're enjoying life because I have picked on you, Bo, and the fact that achievers, especially people who like checking the box sure. on life goals, sometimes you don't take a deep enough breath to enjoy each phase of your life. Yeah, you for know, sure. You're only going to be in your 20s once. You're only going to be in your 30s. Be responsible with that free will. I want you to be a financial mutant and save well, but I also want you to look back on your 20s and 30s and feel like you actually were there. You were yeah. present That's for your point. 20s and 30s. So I think there's a fine balance there. You know what? I'll give you that one. Um, <laughs> I think we, uh, both, we both agreed with each other on that one. Uh, this next one's from Alex. Uh, Alex, you know, because we answered a 529 question earlier. Alex said, um, all right, if my state doesn't give you a tax break, so there's no tax incentive, should I do an UTMA or should I do a 529? So 529 is a col- – well, maybe why don't you answer that? What are the differences in a, an UTMA custodial account and a 529, and how do I decide which one makes the most sense for my child? Well, I, you know, and I'm going to tell you, this is where I, I always challenge people to try to do both mm-hmm. because they have completely different whys and completely different purposes. 529s, as their name implies, is for education. Now, here's the cool thing. Education has been expanded. The umbrella of education has been expanded to so many things that about every kid out there could benefit from this because this is what it will do. And not only it can do K through 12 Private school. That's mm-hmm. that's that's a newer thing in the last decade. It can now also. It's not just college. If your kid goes to trade school, it's going to serve them. I mean, we've used this for clients who their children went to beautician school, yep. trade school, welding, heat and air repair. All that stuff is eligible for five twenty nine. And it, look, if you don't use it for the oldest kid, you can pass it down to the younger siblings. And then if you don't use it for the siblings, you can pass it up to you, the parents, if you want to go back to school. There's all kind of benefits, but it's for education. Mm-hmm. UGMAs, and the reason people like these custodial accounts for kids is because up until you get to a, thresh- a certain threshold, I believe it's a few thousand bucks of investment income from these accounts, they're pretty much tax-free. That's right, yeah. Um, because, you know, instead of it's your higher parental tax rate, they're going to be at, you know, the zero to low tax rate for the kids. That creates a lot of incentive for you to start saving. And this is, and by the way, here's something I love. Um, I'm the type of, of guy, father that when I, I was, I'm, I'm a girl's dad. I uh-huh. have two daughters. My oldest, when I knew I had a daughter, I was like, there's no way I'm paying for a $50,000 wedding. This is the <laughs> stupidest thing that there's weddings that cost thirty-five, fifty thousand dollars uh-huh. whatever they cost. So I said, you know what I'm going to start doing? I'm gonna, when my ch- daughter was born, I started doing $100 a month. Mm-hmm. And at some point, I don't know when, it turned to $200 a month. And that's it. That is all I've done in my daughter's custodial accounts. And I'm telling you, these things are getting big. big. I'm yeah. talking about we have now exceeded the $50,000 yep. wedding and we're working on house down payments, other things, just from a very minimal uh, savings. It's mm-hmm. talking about automatic for the people creating wealth for your your family and your kids. Is that's why custodial accounts are so powerful. And we still, by the way, now she does have to pay income taxes now because she works. My teenager is seventeen, yep. 
But the investment income is still not generating in- taxes, even right. with that much money, because we're buying index funds. Um, they don't generate a lot of taxable income. Mm-hmm. It, it's a really big win, and I think it's going to be a huge head start for, for her, for whether it's weddings, house down payments. And don't forget the, the other tool that wasn't even asked in this question, the custodial Roth. As That's soon as great. your teenager starts working, and they have taxable earned income that you can, you know, because you can do dollar for dollar uh, up to what they earn in wages or, or self-employment income if they're babysitting, cutting grass or whatever, and put that in a custodial Roth. And I always prime the pump. I wanted my daughter to be a saver and a builder of wealth. So I give her a dollar for dollar match, not to exceed what her earned income is, because right. you can't go over that threshold. And it has been very powerful in, in starting that engine of understanding the value of your army of dollar bills. I love it. Uh, when it comes to – he has sort of a pri- – if you're going to do both, a lot of folks end up asking me about a priority question. Should I do the 529 or the UTMA? Which one should I start first? Again, I like mathematics to sort of drive my decisions. I always recommend starting with the 529 because odds are you're going to need those dollars more quickly than you're going to need the UTMA or UGMA dollars if it's going to pay for – wedding or house down payment or something in adulthood, whereas those 529 assets are going to pay for either college starting around 18 or potentially even K through 12 if it's in private well, school. I think it's the intersection of the numbers plus life and yep. the fact that, look, also 529 funding a lot of times has some tax benefits because sure. tax-free growth trumps just the kids. Just growth. Yep. You know, and growth. And the other thing is, is that, look, I think education has a lot of value, whereas the other things I mentioned are that's a privilege to be able to pay for a wedding or to have a house down payment on the priorities of that's what I call first world problems Mm -hmm. right there. So that's what you education, though, I still look at as the ladder out of adversity. Both of us don't come from resources, but because we're good students, education was the way out. Mm -hmm. So that that puts it in a higher tier than um, some of those other life savings goals. Love it. All right, this next question is from James, and I like this one because I feel like we deal, uh, deal with this a lot with our clients that we work with. Now, James said, do you count RSUs, restricted stock units, and options in the 20 to 25% savings rate if we don't plan on touching them? Uh, we are saving 20%, 25% of our AGI for retirement, not including the RSUs and options received through work. Is that too much? So a lot of folks, uh, part of their compensation is, you know, the W-2 that they make, the wages they earn. But if you work for a publicly traded company, it's not uncommon for a big portion or a portion of your compensation to come through uh, stock in that company, whether it be through restricted units that you earn over time or options that you earn over time and can make a decision on how to handle. So when it comes to our personal savings rate and building wealth, are there things we should think about specifically as it relates to those pieces of our puzzle and how much we're saving outside of those pieces of the puzzle. Well, I think this is tying into a bigger question. And I want to, I think this is a good clarifier that I don't know that I've ever covered this a lot. I do count that as part of your savings rate for, for several reasons. First of all, when you're doing RSUs and stock options and other things that you're actually our employee stock purchase plan, you're actually allocating that money, and it will turn into investment capital for you at some point. Now, we don't know what the market value will be. Hopefully, it will be better. Um, but that is definitely saving for you know investment assets. Mm-hmm. So I do think it counts as your 20 to 25%. I think where this gets a little gray is people say, well, what about um, my house? You know, A portion of my monthly mortgage payment is principal. So shouldn't I count that towards my 20 25%? The answer on that is no, because that's actually a use asset. Just like when you pay principal on your car, principal on your house, those are use assets that you're actually living in, you know, as the name implies, using in your everyday life. It's not something that necessarily will provide retirement money. Now, look, there's always going to be people that say, yeah, but my house is appreciating so much. I know I'm going to downsize at some point, and then that will be my retirement. Well, I'll let you count it once you do that. But while you're living in it, because remember, bad stuff, volatility is a lonely person that has to, it's an extrovert, has to be around friends at all times. So typically market volatility will happen when real estate's getting crushed, unemployment is spiking. All these things will happen at the same time, and it's usually not liquid when all those bad things in the world are going on. So that's why I don't count use assets as savings when you're paying those things down, but I do count 
RSUs, stock options. Now, there is a part, and Bo, I'll, I'll leave this for you and let you add your point, that you can have a little bit extra risk when you have your working capital tied into your financial capital. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You know, let's say that you're someone, and as part of your compensation, 25% of your compensation is awarded to you as RSUs or options. You may think to yourself, hey, well, I'm not going to spend that. That's great. I've already got my 25% savings covered, right? If 25% of my comp comes that way, I don't have to save anything else because I'm already checking that box. Well, what most often happens is when we are granted options or when we're granted restricted stock, it usually vests over a certain period of time, meaning I have to be there for two, three, four, five years before I get access to it. Well, with RSUs, it's pretty easy. It vests and I pay tax on it, and then I can decide, do I want to keep holding the stock or do I want to sell it and diversify? I think once you make that choice to sell and diversify, I think then it counts as part of your savings rate because then it actually is deployed as capital. And here's why. Options, you have the option to make a move on that stock. And most often when you're granted stock options, you have a 10-year window in which you can choose to exercise those. Uh, we have a uh, employee here at the firm who previously worked with a large Fortune 100 company for a number of years, and he had a substantial amount of stock options in that company, and that company had been around for a long, 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 long time. It had done really, really well over the years for decades and decades and decades, so it was by all, by all thoughts a safe, a solid investment. Well, one of the things that they kind of talked about the company is, hey, don't, you know, don't ever exercise those options because the stock keeps going up. It keeps going up, keeps going up, keeps going up. Well, that's true until it doesn't. Yeah. And then what ends up happening is if you are someone who has options and the company you're with just happens to have a dip or a downturn right around the time that your options expire and they go below what your strike price is, they actually turn to zero. So yeah. this thing that could have had a lot of value ends up having no value at all. So I think when it comes to your incentives, you ought to think about a way to manage all the different pieces in conjunction with the other parts, parts of your portfolio and the other parts of your saving so that you don't lose control of your financial circumstance. So I think you can include it in your savings rate, but I think you have to kind of do it with a plan in place of how you're going to turn it from company capital into diversified capital. I like that. You kind of added a filter, a little bit of a gauntlet. you got to make it sure That's it goes it. through these checklists before you truly get to count it. Love it. Uh, and by the way, this kind of stuff gets a little nuanced. Yeah. Uh, if you are someone who has a lot of incentives or a lot of your compensation flows that way and you don't have a plan in place, that's probably a great indicator that it might be time for you to take it to the next level, that it might be time for you to reach out for professional help because those things can be very, very nuanced. Um, all right, this next question is from Danny. Uh, Danny said, I want to retire early. I'm putting 15% in the Roth 401k. Should I put 10% in brokerage accounts or pay off my mortgage early or both, 5% and 5%. So my name is Danny. I didn't tell you how old I am. I'm saving 15% to my 401k. I've got another 10%. Do I build in a brokerage or do I pay off my mortgage or do I do a mix of both? It sounds like Danny needs financial a financial order, order of yep. operations because we answer that completely and specifically um, in a lot of ways. Because what I heard, and we all know, by the way, if you want to go download this, I keep holding it up. Like everybody just knows <laughs> automatically where you can get this. Just go to moneyguy.com slash resources. You too can get a free copy of this. And then we even have a deeper dive course for anybody who wants to accelerate yep. their wealth creation. So, so here's the thing. I like 15%. 10% was around forever. There's books that I've got behind me that talk about the 10% savings rates. The problem is those books were written in the 90s, 80s, and – um you could just count on your pension. Yep. But now that people are, you're on your own. I mean, yeah, we have Social Security, and you're likely to have some version of Social Security. It's hard to count on, you know, pensions. It's hard to count on Social Security. It really, a lot of the risk falls on your shoulders in this new modern world. So you better save like that responsibility reflects that. And that's why we always talk about having a savings rate around 25% of your gross income. So hearing you have 15% in your 401k, you have another 10 that could either go into brokerage or something. That's good. That's what it needs to go there. You didn't hear me say mortgage yet because we haven't crossed over the 25% financial mutant savings rate. Where does mortgage fall into, by the way, on the financial order of operations? Nine. Low interest debt. And, and here's why. Because I, I think I get a bad rap on this, and I love people being debt-free. I love you to be debt-free. 
after you're over 45 years of age, mm-hmm. because there's this weird thing, and people don't seem to, to, to take into account where you are in your stage of life, where you are with income, and then where you are with the compounding growth of your army of dollar bills, because those things are all interconnected. Mm-hmm. Let's face it, when you're in your 20s and 30s, life's coming at you fast. You're figuring out your career. You're also probably getting married. You're starting a family. It feels like there are so many things pulling on your back pocket with the kids, with life, that you know you just don't have a lot of money left over. Mm-hmm. But here's what's, what's so in conflict. When you're in your 20s and 30s, every dollar you have is worth so much more. That's why when I, here's a coping mechanism. If you look at a peer and you're like, man, I wish I had their money. I want you, if that person's 15 years older than you, you likely do have more money or at least more opportunity if you use your money wisely. Why do we have this koozie that says this $1 beer cost me $88? It's because a 21-year-old that's drinking this that retires at 66 has the potential that that $1 could turn into 88. You know what happens for the 40 year old? That money could turn into $7. Which is so still great. So it's still but it's good. Not 88. But I mean, you, we cut it by a factor of over 10. Mm-hmm. I mean, so that's why while you have no money that's available while you're in your, the messy middle, the 20s and 30s, while you're figuring out the career. It's important to get some money working Mm -hmm. that can actually have the potential to grow for 45 years. So that's why we're pushing that. Now, here's what happens after 45. First of all, you've hit that magical number. We know from the research at the Ramsey Solutions that the typical millionaire crosses that threshold around 47 to 49 years of age. Has anybody ever really thought about what that means? That, That is, it's a magical 20, you know, if you think about it, it's probably about 25 to 27 years after you entered the workforce, Mm -hmm. your money has had enough time to really start compounding and growing upon itself. And that I think so you have a combination of things that happen after post 45. Your multiplier factor is much lower because you're approaching retirement. Um, You're also the kids are getting older, so they're not requiring as much money. You don't have as many things pulling on your back pocket. And you have the ability, the margin, the excess to let that money work. That's the time to pay off the 2.5% mortgage because you're just not giving up that much of an opportunity cost versus the 20 or 30-something that can really Mm -hmm. take advantage of that multiplying effect. And here's the thing. Uh, We want you to be debt-free in retirement. I will go on on a limb and say at Financial Independence, we have a desire for you to be debt-free or to have the ability to be debt-free. I'm just putting that in there for my own sake. Uh, But one of the things that you said is you want to retire early, right? Well, if you're going to retire early, and when I say early, if that's before age 59 and a half or really before age 55, and you've not done the hard work of building up those after-tax dollars, yeah, you may have your mortgage completely paid off, but you're going to get to the point at age 51 where you say, okay, great, I don't have a mortgage payment. But how am I going to pay for my groceries? Where's my money going to come from? Because I can't go get it from a 401k and I can't go get it from an IRA. I'm not eligible for that Roth IRA to go pull those money out, that money out tax-free. I've got to have that bridge account. I have to have that account that's going to let me bridge the gap to age 59 and a half. So if that's one of your goals, I would let that goal, in addition to all the mathematics that Brian just shared, drive you towards what decision makes the most sense for what you're ultimately trying to accomplish. Um, All right, this next question, this is one from uh, Eric, and this is what Eric B. said. He says, "Uh, my wife is anti-529 for fear of both kids never using it. Uh, I don't know if that's because his wife thinks that both kids are going to get full-ride scholarships or both kids aren't going to go to college. So uh, something to mention there. Um, Is a standard brokerage account uh, using an index fund a good compromise between a 529 and like a standard savings account. So my wife doesn't want to do the 529 because she's afraid that the kids won't use it. So let's talk about that for a moment. Is that a well-grounded fear or is that some, is that like the boogeyman? Well, I, I love, let's go, let's just go ahead and, and role play on that fact. So if you don't, your kids don't go to college, they don't go to trade school, they just don't use it. You realize you always have access to the money you put in. You just have to pay income taxes on the growth, and then you'll pay a penalty of 10% of the growth only. Only not, the uh, growth. Only the growth. Now, here's another you know, opportunity. If your kids do get a scholarship, 
great athlete, great academically, whatever, it doesn't matter the source, as long as it's a scholarship or grant, I believe, <laughs> you could actually get access to the 529 money. You'll still pay income tax on the growth, but they'll waive that penalty on the growth if you have scholarship money. So there's always going to be access to the money. It's just now you lose out on all that tax-free, you know, really stick it to the uncle, our favorite taxing uncle, because your kids are going to college or trade school. Now, if I were in your situation and I were trying to figure out a way to compromise with my wife, if I lived in a state that had a state tax deduction, I would say, you know, sweetheart, I, we really don't like paying taxes. Can we at least think about funding a 529, at least to the extent that we can get the tax deduction? And then maybe our goal is, if we're unsure that our kids are going to go to college, maybe we don't try to save 100% of what we think college is going to cost. Maybe we shoot for some lower number. We're going to save 50% of what we anticipate college costing in a 529, and the other 50% we'll save in a brokerage account or we'll put in a savings account. So that way it's sort of this best of both worlds approach, because if they do go to college and if they do end up needing funds to pay for college, given the option, tax-free growth is way better than taxable growth. Yep. And you're going to get a huge benefit from that. So I would see if there's maybe some middle ground there that you guys can agree on. And then you even have options. You know, if the older one doesn't go, you can always shift down the benefits to the younger one. If the younger one, you can always shift the benefits to other family members if that is what makes the most sense. You have a lot of options. I don't think it has to be an all or nothing thing. And a lot of the folks who I see go anti-529, they live in that world where they think it's all or nothing. It doesn't have to be so static. That's exactly right. Um, all right, this question, this is a car question from John P. Uh, John, John said, hey, car payment question. Does the three-year payment schedule, he's referring to 23-8, uh, does it still matter for 0% auto loans? Uh, so do I still need to abide by 23.8 if the dealership or whoever is going to give me a 0% option? Yeah, this is, you know, look, there is too much of a good thing. I know you guys are using the financial mutant and the army of dollar bills against me here because I talk about how valuable having that money grow for you and build. And when somebody offers you 0%, you're like, whoa. How Brian, can I not that do is that? zero. That's free money. First of all, there might be a catch with the zero percent. I always ask people when your offer is zero percent, was it a choice? Was it a rebate or, or, or a lowering of the purchase price or the zero percent? Because sometimes it might be better to take the lower price vehicle and go line up financing somewhere. Mm -hmm. Or if it's truly just a subsidized zero percent, that's great if you take that loan, like I said, for the legal commitment or credit commitment, but I still personally want you to make your own commitment to yourself, your financial mutant self. You're going to pay it off in three years. And it's back to the fact cars outside of 2021 depreciate rapidly. Mm -hmm. They cost you to fuel them insure them, and repair them. So those type of things all are working against your army of dollar bills and building value and, and financial independence. So I want you just to keep your eyes in check from over-purchasing a vehicle because sometimes that 0%, especially in conjunction with a 72-month stretch mm -hmm. or six years, makes it feel like you can afford about anything. But if you look at your wallet, you look at your life, and you look at your goals of where you want to be, it can be a huge distraction, and that leads to the, the, the last two points I had on the 23.8. You never want, if it's luxury vehicles or expensive vehicles, you know, Mercedes, BMWs, those type of, of, of goals that you, you're rewarding yourself, that's same as cash, mm -hmm. and then never lose focus that your monthly savings, your monthly investments have to exceed what that car payment? Because I, I think there's a lot of people out there that have a thousand dollar car payment yep. and are only putting five hundred dollars in that Roth, and they For think sure. they're crushing it. No, it should be just the opposite. You ought to be putting twelve hundred dollars into your investments and have a three hundred dollar car payment. That's what I consider a better situation. Yeah, one of my closest friends in the world. Uh, this is a number of years ago. Uh, he and his wife were having their uh, first child. They were in the entering into the messy middle. Um, and he was doing everything right from a financial standpoint. He was funding his Roth and following the financial order of operations. And he came and told me, he said, hey, man, uh, the, I bought this new car because we had to do it for the family, and it's what made sense. 
And they gave me really good financing. I don't remember if it was 0% or 1.9%, but I did go ahead and do a five-year loan. I did the 60 months because it's what we needed to do. I was like, man, okay, that's fine, but just know that there's some risk there with you doing that. And there was also some incentive where they didn't have to put a lot down. They didn't yeah. have to do the 20%. And they gave them some reprieve on that. So this is a guy that was doing everything right, doing everything the way he was supposed to do. Well, a few years go by. I want to say it was like maybe two years, 18 months, 24 months. Uh, and his wife is driving, and someone hits her. No fault of her. She was not doing anything wrong. She was not, you know, uh, she was not an at-fault accident. Well, the insurance company comes and looks at it, and they total the car. And they say, okay, well, based on the mileage on this car and how long you've driven it and yada, 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 this is how much we're going to give you a check for. And the check that they gave them was less than the amount that they owed. So they actually were underwater. So he found himself in this really tough predicament where now he had bought a car because his family was expanding and he had, you know, he was making an adjustment. Well, now he was out of car. He still had a loan that he owed money on, and he still had to go replace his car. So even that insurance check that he received, he couldn't go use that to go buy the next car. He had to use it to satisfy the debt that was on the current car. You just don't want to find yourself in that situation. I feel like 0% financing and stretching out financing just increases your likelihood of getting into an underwater position on automobile. You just don't want to do that. You don't want to find yourself there. Um, Daniel discovered for us when we were doing research on one of our most recent car shows. I'm doing this all off memory, but the average car loan is around on a new car is mm -hmm. around thirty seven thousand right. dollars, and it's remember now the average term is seventy two months, so mm -hmm. six years. But here's the here's what I think is interesting about that stat. Daniel found that of that stat, that thirty seven thousand and change. Over $2,000 of the average car purchase price of what was financed was negative <laughs> equity, meaning you owed, you traded in a vehicle that you still had debt on. Mm -hmm. There was over $2,000 of neg negative equity going into that average car price here in the United States. So the lion's share of people out there buying brand new vehicles are trading in vehicles that they still owe more. Yep then the car they're trading in is actually worth. How do you ever own your life? How do you ever build your army of dollar bills if you are trading in vehicles with negative equity? You, you can't that, do it. that is not can't do it. doing it the right way. And that's why we have guidelines like 23.8 to keep yourself honest. So you don't look like the masses that are making horrible financial decisions that are not going to work towards them being financial mutants or building that life that they dream of. Remember, because our whole goal is take a little bit today so you can have that great, big, beautiful mm -hmm. tomorrow. But if, you, if you're never willing to make that sacrifice, you never get the component of time for your mm -hmm. money to invest and grow and work harder than you can. I love it. All right, this next question is from Kyle. Kyle says, uh, I have a friend that has put into a pre-tax 401k for the last decade. We have a Roth 401k option. Uh, which should should he what should he do? <laughs> I love he's not even asking for himself. Kyle's throwing shade at his friend. What should he do? Convert, stay the course, or just change his contribution location? Uh, thanks for the hard work, Brian Bow, and the entire entire content team. So Kyle's not even Kyle knows he's got it figured out. This is what he said. He said, "I know that I'm doing raw. That's what I'm supposed to be doing. But what should my buddy be doing? He's been doing pre-tax for ten years. She converted all that money." Should he switch from doing pre-tax to doing Roth? Should he keep doing pre-tax? How does he know if he's doing the right thing and what he should be doing? Well, you know, we can't give specific advice, but we can give you the, the things that should go into the decision-making process. So, Kyle, hopefully this will help you. A few talking points. First of all, how old are each of you, or especially your friend? What's their, what's their income? Because that when, when you know of somebody's income, you can figure out what tax rate they're in or their marginal tax rate, their effective tax rates. Because taxes have a big impact. Because what's the whole benefit with Roth IRAs? Remember, you don't get a tax deduction when you put the money in. It's always after-tax dollars that go in. But they grow completely tax-free. So when you're exploiting the compounding growth of turning $1 into $88, Roth is like awesome. bonus points because you're not paying income taxes on that $87 that's of right. growth. That's great while you're young, and that's great while you're in a lower income situation. The problem, and I don't know Kyle's friend, but if he's older or in a much higher income situation, because look, the, the top marginal rate right now is 37%, potentially could go up to 396 anytime now. And then the, the state states are five to six. Even if you live in California, it could be as high as 13%. Mm -hmm. 
So you can imagine if you're somebody at 37 percent federal, you live in California and you have another 13 percent that gets strapped on top of that. There's 50 percent not taking into account the Medicare surcharges mm -hmm. and all the other things. You very easily could be in a situation where 50 to 55 percent of your income is completely disappearing. Um, and, and you're probably looking at it going, hey, when I retire, I've heard Brian and Bo talking about three bucket strategy. Mm -hmm. I have after tax, tax deferred, and then Roth. Hopefully, if I retire in my 50s or even 60s, I'm going to have a period of time to essentially manipulate legally yep. the tax code. I'll be in a much lower tax bracket. That's when I should convert. Mm -hmm. um, that type of person, I can see why you want to do a traditional 401k. It's much better to take the tax deduction now. That's not the case for typically a younger person. You just ought to roll right into being a 401k. Now, Bo, I'll let you. I'm going to leave you the heavy lifting for you. Should Kyle's friend... Go ahead and do conversions or just change into a Roth if they're still young and in a lower income situation? Yeah, I, that's a great question. And I think you have to answer the question in, in reverse order. First, you have to decide where should my next dollar go? Yeah. Should my next dollar go pre-tax or go Roth? And then once you figure that out, if you've determined that your next dollar should go Roth, the next question you have to decide is, well, all those dollars that were going pre-tax, should I convert them? Mm -hmm. um, I see all kinds of folks uh, who listen to the show and they hear about this Roth thing for the first time and they hear that they can convert pre-tax dollars and it's like they start itching. They get so excited <laughs> and they start losing their mind. Uh, yeah, it's super cool that you can turn pre-tax dollars into Roth. However, when you do that, that is a big taxable event. So if you want to convert all those pre-tax contributions to Roth, you're going to have to pay income tax on that. And if you've been saving for the last decade and you make the choice to take all that decade of savings plus growth and convert it, there's a good chance that that plus the income that you're earning in that year is going to push you into some of the higher tax brackets. So I don't know that it always makes sense to convert while you're working. There is nothing wrong with dollars growing tax deferred because we're of the opinion that later in life, maybe if you retire early or you have lower income years or other circumstances, that maybe you're single but you're going to get married one day, whatever the thing may be, there will be opportunities likely for you in the future to turn those pre-tax dollars into Roth. I don't think you have to get in like this crazy fervor to do it all as quickly as soon as possible. I have a dear, dear friend uh, who I was reviewing his tax return and I saw that he'd been doing this every year. And he makes a lot of money. And I told him, I was like, hey, you realize every time you do this conversion, you're costing yourself this much in taxes. And it blew his mind. He had, he's like, I didn't even think about that. And I said, the way you're saving, you're going to be able to control your circumstances in retirement. You need to stop trying to convert all your pre-tax money. Just let it continue to grow. Focus on building Roth assets in other ways, like doing backdoor Roths or doing mega backdoor Roths or those sorts of things. You're going to have a way to do that without doing it all right now. So again, I think you need to let your current tax situation dictate, and then you have to make kind of an estimation of what you think your future taxes are gonna be like. But before I'd even get to any of those questions, I'd figure out where my next dollar should go, and I'd focus on that. Um, I do wanna, and look, this is one, it probably does make sense to go to the next level mm -hmm. with your relationship when hiring an advisor, because sometimes there can be one-off events. Think about like pandemic year. So unique in the fact that a lot of people were out of work got unemployment benefits. A lot of those benefits turned out to be tax-free. Mm -hmm. um, if your income, if you're normally in a higher tax situation, all of a sudden your income from a taxability standpoint goes to zero, and yet you still had money coming in because it wasn't taxed, mm -hmm. you could do Roth conversions. That, yep. That's a one-off. And it's just like somebody who retires at 55 or 60, and you're not required to take minimum distributions until 72, and you have a big savings account. That's a great time to convert yep. money, too. But all these things are custom because I do want to tell you, be careful of the unintended consequences because I think a lot of people are, get so excited about the conversions, like you said, but they don't think about it, especially for, I'll talk about the 55 to, to, to 72-year-olds. Where are we at with the, the, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act mm -hmm. on the subsidy that comes yep. in because every one of those conversion dollars impact that? Where are we once you get to Medicare yep. age of 65 with your premiums on that and then you get into how much of your Social Security right. is taxable. I mean, all these things have ripple effects, and that's why you need to kind of know all the variables that go into the decision. And, and a lot of us have blind spots. You don't know these things. I mean, there's a lot of things I've gotten into that are complex. They're like, man, wouldn't it be nice if I had a tour guide mm -hmm. who's been here before? Because yep. there's nothing worse when you're doing something complex and you ask somebody, like, think about you getting a sur surgery, surgery done. 
And there's a commercial on this. And you ask the doctor, hey, you've done a bunch of these, right? And he goes, nope. nope first, first one. one. <laughs> first one. Can't wait to work on you, though. I mean, that is your worst nightmare. But yet every one of my do-it-yourselfers, and I love do-it-yourselfers because I come from, I'm cut from the same cloth. That is what you're doing when you get into some of these complex strategies is that you're looking forward to doing this all by yourself. And that's why I love the abundance cycle because it allows us give you free advice, give you all the information. But I know if you do this right and you listen to what we share, there'll come a time and maybe it's a few years, maybe it's a decade in the future. You're going to look at your your financial life and go, holy goodness, this is amazing what I've created here. With this input, let's. I, I, I don't know what I don't know, and I want to make sure I'm not doing this the first time. And that's when you'll think about the abundance cycle. You'll remember the Money Guy show, and hopefully you'll take the relationship to the next level. And until that time, we're going to keep loading you up. If you've not gone to our website, you can go to moneyguy.com slash resources. We have a plethora of free deliverables out there, how powerful are your dollars, a tax guide, the financial order of operations. If you've not had a chance to check out the new FYI by FTE blog, you should go check that out now. Not only do we have a video component, not only do we have an audio component, Daniel is actually diving even deeper into some of the contents, some of the content we go over. So make sure you go check that out. And as always, if you have any questions, if you want to know more about us, if you want us to lean into your financial life, you can always communicate with us through the website. You can go to moneyguide.com or you can go to aboundwealth.com. Contact us. We love hearing from you guys because we do this show for you so that you can take your finances to the next level. Guys, thanks so much. I'm Brian Preston, Mr. Bo Hansen, Money Guy team, out.